Welcome to the NMNA video tutorials on CSP Technologies, Block 6, Unit 3. Introduction to Sensors for Thermal Measurements. My name is Nicole Janot and I have been working on CSP Technologies at DLR for more than six years. My main fields of work are parabolic trough and component performance testing, test evaluation and performance simulations. This unit is subdivided into four main parts. First, there will be a general introduction to measuring thermal collector performance. Then, the required measurements and options for measurement equipment will be presented. Subsequently, temperature and flow rate measurements will be focused on in individual sections. Finally, the unit will be concluded with a brief summary. The thermal and overall performance of a parabolic trough collector is usually expressed in terms of the useful heat generated by the device. This corresponds to the enthalpy gain of the HTF while flowing through the system. Hence, the useful heat flow rate is calculated from its heat balance. The measurements required to solve the heat balance comprise the mass flow rate, or volumetric flow rate and fluid temperature, as well as the temperatures at the inlet and outlet of the unit. Furthermore, the thermophysical properties of the heat transfer fluid have to be known. Its density is required to calculate the mass flow rate from the volumetric flow rate. The specific heat capacity needed for the calculation of the enthalpy gain of the HTF. The value of the mean specific heat capacity is determined by means of integration in the relevant temperature interval and not trivial for nonlinear functions of heat capacity with temperature. The precise experimental determination of temperature characteristics of the thermophysical properties of the HDF is very challenging. The measurement processes involved are fraught with uncertainty and represent a considerable distribution to the overall uncertainty budget. Exemplary temperature characteristics for VP1, the most commonly used HDF, are illustrated in the diagrams on the bottom right of the slide. At the same time as measuring system performance, the ambient conditions under which this performance is achieved are to be monitored in order to be able to evaluate or rate the performance, especially in terms of efficiency. In this context, the most influential test characteristic is the irradiance, in particular the direct normal irradiance, but also global horizontal and diffuse horizontal irradiance. But further test conditions like the ambient temperature and wind velocity are also relevant. Changes in wind velocity, for example, can alter cooling conditions and even more importantly affect the tracking and intercept by deformation of the concentrator geometry. Furthermore, the tracking quality can differ with the sun's position and resulting tracking angles. For example, due to imbalances of the concentrator or lack of stiffness of the receiver supports, the tracking may be better at high sun elevation than at lower. Thus, performance results may vary according to wind velocity and collector orientation. Therefore, testing conditions are ideally kept constant during testing or at least monitored so that outliers, deviations and peculiarities in test results can be explained after evaluation. The required measurements can be subdivided into two different categories. Those related to ambient conditions like irradiance, ambient temperature and wind direction and velocity and properties of the HDF or the parabolic trough collector itself, such as the HDF flow rate and temperature or cleanliness and collector angle. The measurement of ambient conditions is independent of the test setup and is usually carried out using a mobile irradiance or meteorological station. The collector angle and mirror cleanliness characterize the status and condition of the units during performance testing. They are monitored using inclinometers and a reflectometer. The HDF inlet and outlet temperatures as well as the mass flow rate are fluid bound properties. Within a mobile measurement laboratory they can only be measured using clamp on sensors. And just a quick recapitulation of the points in favor of the mobile measurement laboratory for short term performance testing. 
They are relatively flexible and can be mounted quickly to an existing installation without causing any leakage hazard or plant downtime due to changes of the HDF system. On the other hand, the mobile equipment requires experience to avoid measurement imprecisions. In particular, these temporary measurements require intensive cross-checking as later detection of errors is often impossible. As generally known, temperature cannot be measured directly but only on the basis of other characteristics. Commonly used temperature-dependent characteristics are the fluid volume used in liquid and glass thermometers, the thermoelectric voltage as for thermocouples, the electrical resistance thermistor or resistance temperature detectors. For RTDs, the measured electrical resistivity of a coiled wire, mostly made from platinum, is correlated with its temperature. The elements themselves are very fragile and therefore usually placed inside a shed probe to protect them. In practical applications, this measurement principle offers higher accuracy and repeatability than thermocouples, for example. As a consequence of the dimensions of the coiled wire, the sensors are non-punctiform. For correct temperature measurements, a sufficient immersion into the measured quantity needs to be assured. This is to fully cover the sensor and prevent possible influences of the ambient via conduction along the sheds. The response time of RTD sensors depends on the thermal inertia of the sheds or casing protecting the fragile element. PT100 sensors are the most common type of resistance temperature detectors. They consist of a coiled platinum wire with a standard resistance of 100 ohms at 0 degrees centigrade. PT100 sensors exhibit an almost linear characteristic of sensor resistance with temperature as illustrated in the graph on the right. The sensors are further classified according to maximum allowable deviations of the measured temperature. As displayed in the figure on the bottom right, Type B sensors, represented by the green line, have the widest limiting deviation, whereas those of Type A, the red line, are more narrow, representing a higher measurement accuracy. A four-wire connection of the sensor to the evaluation unit eliminates the influence of contact and wiring impedances by separating the current and voltage electrodes. In order to use PT100 sensors for clamp-on temperature measurements, two main requirements need to be fulfilled. First of all, heat-resistant and robust clamp-on installations are needed to fix the sensor to the piping. Besides, a sensor configuration with low measurement uncertainty is to be conceived. Let's have a look at the setup so far. The temperature sensor is clamped to the outside of a hot pipe with the hot HDF flow inside. It is in the nature of such a setup that it is prone to actually detect a temperature in between the outer wall temperature of the pipe and the ambient. In order to reduce the influence of the ambient, the setup is to be insulated. However, a temperature difference between the fluid temperature and the sensor temperature will remain. This is due to the temperature difference across the tube wall, the heat transmission from the tube wall to the sensor and the exposure to the cold ambient. An optimized sensor configuration aims at reducing these perturbations to a minimum. In terms of measurement location, pipe sections in the close vicinity of support structures are to be avoided. Such structures are likely to dissipate heat to the surroundings, which results in reduced and non-representative pipe temperatures. For the improved clamp-on temperature measurements, the PT100s are enclosed in a brass block. The good thermal conductivity of the brass homogenizes the temperature in the close vicinity of the sensor. Metal hose clamps are used to strap the brass block and the sensors to the pipe. The blocks also mechanically protect the sensors from the stress applied to securely and firmly tighten them to the pipe. Using high temperature heat conductive paste at the surface in contact enhances the conduction. Furthermore, additional copper shields that are thermally coupled to the pipe are used to decrease the temperature gradient across the sensor and brass block. The effect of the shields is illustrated in the schematic. As shown there, the addition of the copper shields reduces the temperature deviation of clamp-on sensors from built-on ones by half and also reduces the slope of the deviation with temperature. 
This is particularly interesting for performance testing where the temperature difference between a cold inlet and a hotter outlet is most relevant. In this case, part of the deviation cancels. In terms of positioning, the sensors should be attached at an adequate distance from the contact points of the shields to avoid measuring potential effects of local cooldown of pipe surfaces due to the heat conductive shields. Finally, the temperature sensor installation is filled with insulating mineral wool to prevent convection and housed in a wind-tight and rainproof casing, both of which are not displayed on the slide. Various principles are available for flow rate measurements in HTF systems of parabolic trough power plants. On the right side, the following are depicted from the top to the bottom. A turbine flow meter measures the flow rate as a function of the turbine speed that is correlated to the volumetric flow rate. In an orifice meter, the passing of the flow through an orifice results in a pressure drop across the orifice, which can be measured. The pressure drop increases with increasing flow rate. Alternatively, nozzles can be used with the same measurement principle but smaller pressure drops. Vortex meters involve the insertion of a bluff body into the fluid flow. They measure the frequency of the vortex shedding in the wake of the body in terms of pressure fluctuations. This frequency is proportional to the flow rate of the fluid. Ultrasonic flow meters are based on the interaction of ultrasonic signals and the fluid flow. In case of the travel time method, the mean speed of the flow and the volumetric flow rate are determined from the difference in travel time of the signals traveling upstream and downstream. For meters based on the Doppler effect, the bulk flow rate is derived from modulations of the signal frequency caused by traveling disturbances, for example in two-phase flow. All above principles measure the volumetric flow rate which needs to be converted to mass flow rate using the fluid density from performance evaluation. The only way of directly measuring mass flow rate is by making use of the Coriolis principle. To this end, the flow is diverted via two curved parallel and counter vibrating tubes. The force required for acceleration and deceleration of the HTF in the arms of the deviation introduces a time shift in their vibration. The magnitude of this time shift depends on the mass flow rate. Coriolis meters benefit from very high accuracy and low uncertainty. Of all above principles, only the ultrasonic flow meter is available as a clamp-on version as ultrasonic signals can be injected through the piping. Ultrasonic flow meters based on the principle of travel time difference require a set of two ultrasonic transducers sending and receiving signals. They are mounted to receive one another's signals as illustrated in the sketch. The travel time of a signal traveling downstream is compared to the travel time of a signal traveling upstream and the transit time is derived. Using the geometry of the pipe, especially its inner diameter or outer diameter and wall thickness and the distance of the sensors, the mean fluid velocity is calculated. In combination with an assumed flow profile, this leads to the volumetric flow rate. Finally, the mass flow rate is derived from the volumetric flow rate with the help of the temperature-dependent HDF density. For transit time difference ultrasonic flow measurements, the flow should be turbulent. As both the fluid viscosity and density are temperature dependent, the fluid temperature has to be measured in the vicinity of the flow measurements and the respective characteristics stored in the evaluation device. Depending on the acoustic properties of the fluid and the pipe material and mounting options, different sensor installations and sound paths may be chosen for travel time difference ultrasonic flow measurements. In opposite mode, the sensors are mounted on opposite sides of the pipe and the number of sound paths is uneven. In this mode, it is rather challenging to position the sensors in a way that they are exactly facing one another. Therefore, the reflection mode with even numbers of sound paths, both sensors on one side is often preferred. The choice of the exact number of sound paths is then a trade-off between the measurement uncertainty that decreases with the number of sound paths and the signal strength that also decreases. There are a number of preconditions to assuring reliable flow measurements using ultrasonic clamp-on meters. 
In order to be able to deduce the volumetric flow rate from the mean fluid flow velocity, the flow profile must be known. The flow profile can only be derived for fully developed flows. Assuring fully developed flow in, in turn implies the need for a sufficiently long unimpeded piping upstream of the measurement point. Furthermore, good acoustic coupling using a coupling gel must be provided to produce stable and continuous signals. And last but not least, sensors must be positioned exactly, not only for reasons of signal quality, but also in order to assure that the distance actually traveled by the signal corresponds to the calculated distance used in the evaluation. In terms of measurement point selection, particular care is required in order to assure a sufficiently long, unimpended pipe length upstream and downstream of the measurement point. For a number of typical sources of disturbances, like elbows, T-fittings, diameter changes, valves and pumps, specific minimum inlet and outlet zones or lengths are defined. In case of a regular valve, a minimum distance of four diameters is required to assure a fully developed flow profile if the sensor is mounted downstream of the valve, and a minimum of 10 pipe diameters if it is mounted upstream of the disturbance. Further considerations apply to the selection of the measurement point in general. For reasons of signal quality and deviations in material or geometry, piping sections with deformed or damaged tubes, areas close to welding seams should be avoided. Likewise, parts prone to fouling or deposition are unfavorable because of the reduction of the effective parameter and varying wall properties. Bubbles or particles reduce the signal quality and effective flow rates of the actual medium. Furthermore, piping sections that might possibly only be filled partly during operation are unsuitable as the sensors cannot detect the level in the pipe. In practice, the above recommendations translate to simple rules for choosing a measurement point as illustrated in the diagrams. Rising pipes are preferred to down pipes, lateral sensor positions are preferred to top or bottom ones, and knees are preferred to arcs that might drain during operation. Vertical pipes are ideal but often difficult to access or do not have sufficient independent upstream pipe length. In practice, mounting a clamp-on ultrasonic flow meter can be broken down to the following steps. First of all, the measurement point is chosen according to the criteria discussed previously. Then all rust, paint, etc. must be removed thoroughly from the pipe in order to assure good signal coupling. The pipe diameter and wall thickness must be known or measured. In the next step, the fluid characteristics like its speed of sound, viscosity and density, as well as the characteristics of the piping, such as the geometry and material, are to be entered into the evaluation unit. On the basis of these inputs, the spacing of the sensor heads is determined and the heads can be mounted. In case of a mass flow measurement, the temperature sensor is to be installed as well. In a final step, all sensor signals should be checked for plausibility. For a known material and speed of sound, the wall thickness of an installed pipe can be measured with an ultrasonic transceiver as well. If the speed of sound is not known for a material, it can also be determined with the same transceiver using a spare piece of piping and determining its wall thickness and the travel time of the ultrasonic signal. For wall thickness measurements, ultrasonic flow meters that offer this option are to be turned to the corresponding mode. The longitudinal speed of sound adjusted to the material of the pipe and the clean pipe surface probed with the sensor is sketched. The speed of sound of the material is the key input. Errors in entered values linearly propagate into the resulting wall thickness. In order to obtain an average value for the wall thickness, multiple measurements along the circumference of the pipe are to be taken. The outer pipe diameter is determined using a sliding caliper measuring at different positions around its circumference to account for potential asymmetry of the pipe and then averaging the values to obtain a representative mean. In combination with the results of the wall thickness measurements, this mean outer diameter is used to determine the inner diameter of the pipe. 
Particular challenges of clamp-on ultrasonic flow measurements lie in the exact determination of the inner pipe diameter and the mounting of the sensor heads. The sensors are limited by the temperature limitations of the piezo elements in the sensor heads. Therefore, measurements are always carried out at the coldest pipes of the system, for example at the collector inlet, to minimize the temperature load and measurement uncertainty. Furthermore, the estimation of the flow profile from the unknown roughness of the inner piping walls can be an issue. For mass flow measurements, the temperature characteristic of the fluid density needs to be known with high precision. Within the scope of this unit, non-invasive measurements of fluid-bound properties are focused on. They have been demonstrated to require particular care and special sensor configurations. For temperature measurements, reinforced PT100 sensors with improved thermal coupling have been introduced for HTF inlet and outlet temperature. For measuring the HTF flow rate, the use of an ultrasonic transit time difference flow meter with temperature input and wall thickness measurement facilities has been demonstrated. This brings us to the end of the unit introducing sensors for thermal measurements. Thank you for your attention.